You're listening to the Banana Data Podcast, a podcast hosted by Data IQ. I'm Trevaney. And I'm Will. And we'll be taking you behind the curtain of the AI hype, exploring what it is and what it isn't capable of. On the season three finale, we're covering model accuracy and how the New York Times keeps humans in the loop across all of their machine learning algorithms. You know, Will, when we make models, sometimes they're wrong. I mean, usually they're wrong about something. No model is 100%. But sometimes a model is just completely wrong, right? Like we we think we know one thing about our data or the situation we're in, and it turns out that we had no idea. So today I wanted to talk about that idea of models are completely wrong. It came up on a blog by the Royal Statistical Society. Sounds very fancy. I think it just means they're British. (laughs) This comes from a place of modeling for infectious diseases. As you know, a lot of different reports and studies have been done on COVID-19. And in fact, we're finding out that a lot of those models are wrong because our assumptions are off or what we thought we know, we actually don't know. And the point I think that they're making here in this blog, right, is that there's a bigger picture of not only how we understand our models, but how we communicate about them, how we make clear what the limitations are that we can all take lessons from. You know, they're targeting in this set of rules, they're targeting the infectious disease community. But I think that these are lessons that can be taken, you know, far beyond that. Yeah, Trevi, this article actually, it really frustrated me. And so with all due respect to the Royal Statistical Society, who in all seriousness has obviously like made a lot of contributions to statistics, data science, like the field in which we work. I don't like this article. And there's kind of two reasons why. You want them? Let's hear it. First reason why I'm frustrated is every time we have like the financial crisis of 2008 or anytime things go wrong, And then people realize that, hey, we actually need to rely on data and science. Oh, but hey, actually, scientists or the data scientists or the epidemiologists or the economists, like, actually, they're not perfect. There are errors in their models. We always have these debates. And so I'm frustrated because of two things. The article kind of puts the blame on the scientists. It says, hey, when you're a scientist, uh, you need to be responsible and thoughtful about how you convey uncertainty. And so that's frustrating to me for two reasons. One, because I think that they're right. And I think that scientists have failed and they continue to fail in sufficiently conveying the uncertainty of their work. So that's beef one I have with this article is like, man, scientists, we got to learn. Like you should include error bands or confidence intervals in all of your graphs. Anytime you publish a graph anywhere, you got to put a confidence interval in it, like in big, pink colors. So that's thing one I don't like about this article is, man, I'm frustrated scientists haven't figured this out by now. Then second, I don't know if I'm that sophisticated to simultaneously hold disparate potential truths in my mind. If you're like, oh, well, it could be this and it could be this. My simple mind is just like, just tell me which one's most likely. And that's the story I'm going to hear. And so I think this article also says, hey, when you're a scientist that publishes a model, you need to be thoughtful and conveying a sense of uncertainty. I feel like people are always going to pick the most likely, like the modal scenario and just say, that's the story I'm going to hear. And I'm going to walk away with that one story in my mind, no matter what. And that's also frustrating to me, but that's kind of more where the onus is on the readers or the media. There's a lot there, Trevaney. Do you agree with any of it? Yes or no? Well, I think you're, what you're saying is the two critiques are the two sides of the same coin. You're saying that there's a issue with the way that we communicate and understand data science generally. And when we think about forecasts around economics or public health or whatever, scientists should be being transparent, providing that level of uncertainty and all. But on the other hand, people who are consuming those those models or understanding those models need to be willing to either hold on to some level of uncertainty or acknowledge that, okay, I'm going to believe this thing, but with this this level of doubt. Like a chicken egg problem is what you're saying. The media doesn't publish things that really demonstrate the uncertainty of the underlying result. And because the media or the journal or the public doesn't have an appetite for that, scientists don't give it to them. So then the readers don't become more sophisticated. It's like a downward spiral. It is a burden that is being 
shared or a burden that has to be shared by both sides. So scientists, yes, they do need to communicate that uncertainty. They should be describing the assumptions of their models. They should be transparent, all of these things. I think that's really important. And that's important even when you're in the business world, right? Or like in your company providing information out to to end users. But consumers, journalism, the business executives looking at your model need to understand that the people making these models are not infallible demigods of data power, though I would love to think of myself as such. But there is a flaw, like there are going to be flaws and accept that there will be flaws. I think we as humans can't hold multiple models or multiple modes of uncertainty in our minds. And, you know, maybe that's true from some sort of biological reason, but can we at least hold that this is the best we can do with the information we have while acknowledging that it still could be wrong? Maybe even if we can't expect a reader or one to kind of process information in that way, they can at least recognize that, hey, if you are thinking of like one modal outcome, like this is the thing that's going to happen but you at least kind of have a shred of doubt in your mind, which is it could always be wrong. It could always happen in some other way. That's better and it's doable than just having kind of one outcome in your head and believing that's infallible. I like that. That's a good distinction. But when you're in the business world, you still have to make decisions based on that. I understand the, you know, the fear around providing uncertainty with a forecast, but I think that's where rubber meets the road that, Hey, we forecast that we're going to decrease sales by 10% over the next three months. The leader, business leader says, okay, well, then we need to do X, Y, Z to account for that, knowing that it might not be 10%. It might be more. It might be less. Yeah, and you're talking about decision makers. And in the article, they kind of have these rules for how we should think about uncertainty. And another thing is that they say policymakers. So you could substitute just decision maker for policymakers. But policymakers should use multiple models to inform policy. And that's kind of something we've talked about throughout our time on the podcast that's also obviously relevant here, which is just diversity of inputs, I think, because we've also maybe in the past talked about the concept of ensembling. So, you know, you take model A, you take model B, and then your concept of a prediction is some weighted combination of model A and model B. So that's another kind of bit of nuance when we think about uncertainty and diversification, like how you add diversification and also probably uncertainty of predictions by allowing more people to participate. Oh, yeah, I think that's that's for sure. And, you know, what you're saying makes me think, again, of more distinctions and what you were saying before with, you know, people being able to hold multiple models of uncertainty in their mind. You know, scientists and policymakers and decision makers are coming into whatever they're doing with that expectation that I'm not going to have a full answer. But the average person reading the newspaper or whatever is looking for something to hang on to, something to to grab onto. And as a result, then we have these journalists that will go ahead and make a statement or make a claim that is very bold, very, you know, grabbable, even if it's not right. And we did talk about this a little bit with Karen Howe a few episodes ago. And she rightly points out that it's it's a trade-off, right, between okay, well, I, I need to get people's attention, but I also need to make sure that what I'm saying is correct and, um, you know, compelling, but not false. They rightly point out that there's a role for journalists here as well to both provide that level of uncertainty and also doing their full research. But I think that when it comes to the question of how do I understand uncertainty, it will be different for the business leader versus the average person reading the newspaper. Yeah. And then one other thought that they bring up in this article, which I think actually kind of segues into the next article I wanted to talk with you about, was that researchers should be as transparent as possible. And also this we talked about this with Karen Howe, right? She was I asked her, I remember on the podcast, said, you know, what do you do if you're reporting on AI? And some AI researcher essentially is saying, oh, this is proprietary or I can't tell you. And she would refuse to work with them. Similarly, if you are a policymaker that's trusting the predictions of an epidemiologist and then you ask kind of deeper questions and you don't get answers because they're not being transparent, you should just refuse to work with them. And so in general, I think going back to your previous point, like being transparent is a good way for 
people to gain faith, people to understand like the process and understand that there is uncertainty inherent. And obviously it's not just that easy. You can't just publish your entire like 50 page scientific journal article and say, yeah, everyone read all of this. And then you'll understand my thought process. Like that's too much information for most people to process. We don't have that sort of time, but nevertheless, how you try to be intentional with your transparency, I think is is another good way to convey uncertainty in your results and help gain support and help steer action. Now it's time for at least my favorite part of the episode where we explain complex data science topics in plain English. So Tarani, could you please explain to me subpopulation analysis? Yeah, subpopulation is actually a really great tool for mitigating bias inside of our machine learning models. And the idea comes from this question of fairness. When we build a machine learning model, we're often looking at how well does this perform overall? You know, how many cases did it predict correctly or incorrectly? But in terms of subpopulation analysis, what we want to see is whether or not that machine learning model was as effective at predicting the outcome for different subpopulations of our data. If I work at a large credit card company and my task is to detect fraud on new credit card transactions, I might build a model that does really well, you know, 95% accurate. But then in terms of subpopulation analysis, I want to make sure that that model performs equally well across the different countries where, you know, our clients use the card. So if I look at the overall model, I see that it performs at a 95% accuracy. But when I test the model for subpopulation analysis, I see that in the UK, this model is only performing with 80% accuracy versus in Brazil, where it's performing with 98% accuracy. So even though overall I'm doing quite well, the subpopulation analysis is telling me that my model is biased against certain groups in my data. So in that sense, subpopulation analysis is really useful in helping you differentiate where a model is doing really well and where it's not, so that you can make it equal and fair across all the different subgroups in your data. Thanks so much for explaining that in English. And relating back to the previous discussion about transparency and uncertainty, I actually also wanted to talk to you, Trevaney, about an article by the New York Times data team about their machine learning system that they use for comment moderation. And this article is kind of giving a lot of, I thought, great transparency and great insight into how the New York Times has engineered this system, kind of how they used to do it, how they currently do it and uh, some interesting lessons they've learned. But again, I think it's really responsible of them and as a New York Times reader, faith in them when they're coming out and not just saying, hey, trust us, we moderate comments. Actually, in this very article, they talk about how they do it and they even admit, you know, there are certain ways where they make judgment calls in their algorithms in terms of deeming what content is offensive and what content is not. And they say, hey, there's uncertainty. Maybe we are kind of rejecting articles in this algorithm that are not actually offensive, or maybe we're making errors of another kind. But I think the transparency that they provide is great. So I thought this would make a nice compliment to our previous discussion. Yeah, I thought this was really great of the New York Times to put out an article explaining their processes like this. You know, the New York Times collects a lot of data. They have a very robust data science center, and it's really nice to see them share back to the community in a in a more open way. And what I think they, you know, they talk about their a model that they use for comment moderation. And it's really interesting because they used to have only humans building or checking comments for quality, but that meant that they could only allow comments on a small amount of articles. When they wanted to expand out and let there be more comments on more, more stories, they created this moderator system and that uses a machine learning system called perspective. And that actually does a lot of sort of contextual and machine learning around text information to decide whether a comment is spam or obscene or toxic. And then after the model has sort of scored a comment, it goes to a human moderator again to just review, okay, these are the ones that we decided are actually problematic. The model says, let me know if that's actually true or not. So it's this really unique sort of human plus machine process that it's kind of the ideal human in the loop story. I think there are two things about this article kind of that I liked also, and I think could allow 
for other listeners to learn from, right? Even if you're not the New York Times, what are some broader themes? And so to your point about using this perspective system, so again, perspective being the name of the, the algorithm or the ML system that they employ kind of as a first pass. I, I like that this algorithm looks at text and then it rates it on a few different dimensions. So one being obscenity, so looking at like swear words, and one being like a spam score as well. So maybe there's no sw- swear words, but they're trying very clearly to sell you some particular product. And I think even in 2020, one thing I like to talk about in this podcast is AI is great, but you know we're not yet at super intelligence. And if you're a business that's building out an AI or a, a data-driven system, it should go without saying that you need to include some sort of domain level specificity in your in your model or in your system, right? So here it's not just blanket looking at text and kind of flagging things as good or bad, but it's being a little bit more nuanced. And it's saying, okay, this text, it's not good or bad, but it's definitely high in the obscenity score, but actually, you know, it's low on everything else. So maybe we want to pass it through to the human moderators because maybe someone was just fired up. <laughs> and then the other bit, which is that after the algorithm looks at the comments, then these comments get passed to humans and they say, yep, this is good to go. No, this should stay out of the Times comments. The people who make those judgments, so those are human readers, uh, and the New York Times in this blog post, they're very explicit to state that those readers are, you know, trained New York Times editors or, you know, they've been working at the New York Times for a long time. They really understand the Times, what they're trying to do kind of as an organization. And so they say, you know, this work, is not outsourced, but instead it's kind of a crucial, important responsibility for the business. And we've talked in the past about this idea of data labeling and how you get labeled data to do supervised learning. And so often I think it's thought of as kind of, and this is a a really pejorative term, which I don't like, but like unskilled labor, right? You just need some human to quickly identify, is that a blue shirt or a red shirt? But so often I would imagine businesses other than the New York Times too they need humans to make these uh, labeling decisions who actually are quite skilled. Like they have a lot of domain knowledge. And so I thought that was just really cool to hear the New York Times call out and say, this is really important work. We think because we have such qualified people doing it, we're getting better data quality, ergo a better algorithm, ergo a better reader experience. It's not just, you know, data labeling in this case. These moderators are actually verifying that the model is operating according to their standard, standards. You know, this is, this is truly human in the loop, responsible AI as a part of their processes, right? This is the kind of thing that, you know, I love to talk about. And what they're doing here is they're saying, here's what an algorithm decided. Before we implement it, let's confirm that it fits our expectations. Let's confirm that it fits what we know to be true. And we're not just data labeling in this case. We're actually validating the model or, you know, tweaking accordingly. And so, I would argue that it's it's not even data labeling and it's not outsourcing, certainly, but it is truly a responsible AI pipeline. And so, yeah, I think it's great that they've brought in this, this human into the loop, but it raises a lot of other questions for me. You know, language is not static. What was offensive 20 years ago is not really offensive anymore. And, and vice versa, you know, things that people thought were OK to say even 10 years ago are actually very problematic. And we now you know, try and uh, account for that and how we communicate. So I'm curious to know or, or think about how a machine learning algorithm could actually stay up to date. If it sees some new form of an obscenity that it doesn't realize is such, then what happens? If the person who's supposed to label that as obscene doesn't think it is. The human moderators, they do have a lot of trust that's been given to them. And I think the Times, in their defense, maybe states this somewhat implicitly, which is that those people need to, that they have a lot of responsibility because they're the ones ultimately who continue to monitor and flag text. And so if there's some new term that has never before been written and now it's kind of understood culturally to be offensive or inappropriate or a term that was offensive and inappropriate and now is okay, like it's up to those moderators to judge that. And then the data goes back in and feeds the algorithm. I do think it was interesting quote from the article is that those moderators are determining whether or not content fits, quote, the time standards for civility and taste, which I loved. It was very like, (laughs) ah, yes, this is civil and tasteful, but that's a loaded term right there, right? Who are the people that we determine as a society are deciding that content is civil and tasteful? I don't know. You know, this is right up our alley. 
And so this is not specifically a comment on the New York Times moderators, who I know are trained and have a lot of experience in doing what they're doing, but just a bigger question of who is deciding when when the line needs to be redrawn and how do we ensure that people who are making those decisions are actually making them with the right intentions in mind. All right, before we head out, the banana riddle of the episode is here. This is my favorite part of the episode, Will. So on a 12-hour digital clock, there will be some numbers that are actually palindromes. A palindrome is something that can be read forwards and backwards as the same thing. So for example, 303 is a palindrome. And what I want to know is on that 12-hour digital clock, what is the smallest amount of time between two numbers that are palindromes? So for example, 101 is a palindrome, 202 is a palindrome. And the time between them is 61 minutes. Now, that's not the smallest interval. There might be an even smaller interval that we could look at. So take your time to figure that out, and we'll reveal the answer in the episode notes next week. Well, that's a wrap on season three. And on a more serious note, this is actually Will's final episode with us on the podcast. Yes, it's absolutely been a pleasure, Trevaney, and uh, the rumors are true. This has indeed been my final episode with the Banana Data Podcast, but our listeners should fear not because Trevaney and some fresh new voices will be back soon for season four uh, with some great new data science content. Thanks so much for being on the podcast, Will. It's been great working with you, and we'll see you out there. That's all we've got for today in the world of Banana Data. We'll be back with another podcast in two weeks. But in the meantime, subscribe to the Banana Data newsletter to read these articles and more like them. We've got links for all the articles we discussed today in the show notes. All right. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure, Trevaney. It's been great, Will. See you next time.